I won't lie about it. Okay. I don't know. You got it? Okay. Can we go back into some ancient history and then move forward? And, and we covered that area about uh, where it's gone to and what's happened? Well, I just, I recorded me, so turn it back on with Ringo. Uh, you want to run back and see where you were? No, no, I know. I, I know. Yeah. I just want to know if that satisfied you. If you had something else you wanted to say, then please add it. Let me put it back on. Yes, and handgun violence. Or else I will uh, <laughs> do something nasty to your family. That's just some of the stuff that you're into. And what's happened, where it is now, the, is that it's a, it's a part of our consciousness. You know, whereas it wasn't a, a year or so ago. But I mean, after, what does it take? A Polish pope or a piano playing poet or a Protestant president, you know, the PP people. Uh, to make people angry, it's sad. I can give you stats. I can roll up stats for you all day long. You know, and, uh, almost twice as many people killed in America with handguns than there were in the entire Vietnamese War, you know, <laughs> which always blows my mind. The fifth leading cause of child death and so on in America, and you don't have the right and so on and so forth. And you're more likely to be killed by them, and it's not good. And it doesn't help, and we can't do anything. And I mean, we've got to stop it now, otherwise it's just going to be chewing at me and got handguns by the year 2000. In which case, that's when your Fourth Amendment rights do get violated, because that's when we're going to confiscate them. That's the only answer to that. And it won't be me doing it, it'll be some Republican asshole doing it. You know? Okay, so ancient history, where were we? <laughs> Transitions are very difficult from a subject of such enormous importance. No, it's all silliness anyway. I mean, don't, if you try to tell somebody, you know, hey, don't jump, don't, it's like, look out behind you. They never look. You know, if they do, they walk into a wall. I mean, so it's all silliness anyway. So where do you... I mean, if you take it too seriously, you drive yourself to drink. In my case, it's a short putt. But on the other hand, if you take it lightly, uh, you can't keep the balance going. That seems to be the name of the game. You don't hope to convert people, but you do try to keep a balance going with them. So the jerks don't have too much control. You know, those of us who think they're jerks. And the idea is to basically get to the congressman and the Senate and say, uh, look, do you want your job? You know, you want to get elected or uh, re-elected? Well, then you better agree with or better start agreeing with our point of view. Otherwise, we're going to make sure that you don't get elected. We're going to do that by filling our coffers, our PAC, Political Action Committee coffers, with lots of bread. And we'll spend it just to defeat you, you know? And the idea is to create a parity with the NRA. I don't mean the National Reclamation Act of 1932 or whatever it was. Uh, I mean the National Rifle Association. They just make themselves Rifle Association. They have classes in hunting with a handgun. Amazing bunch of people. Harlan Carter, a man once convicted of murder. Mm. Yeah, and this is the Can you pass that magazine over? The book, right? The little one? Right there? Mm. Uh, this is my favorite book. Look what it says. It's from the book digest. It says, My Life in the CIA by William Colby. Now, that looks like the first of joke. Yeah, you'll find his, he, he may become uh, the national chairman of what we're trying to start, the alliance to end hang on violence. His name is on that letter, on the list. William Colby, along with Bob Hope and those others. But so, what sounds silly in the end may not be, and if you treat it silly, you may be wrong. If you treat it too seriously, you're being silly. <laughs> okay? Try, uh, just a little side note, try to get involved with some friends in putting together uh, an enormous telethon uh, on the level of a Jerry Lewis kind of thing. For what? Handgun control. It won't let you. And, uh, it's not a charity. Well, it seems to me there's a way of doing that. Okay, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a I've tried. I made a, a, uh, I made a whole bunch of uh, public service announcements on, on uh, for TV, and uh, they wouldn't. Even, I got them sent back with nasty notes, and they said you're kidding and things like that. Two stations ran it out of 25. Really? Yeah, they wouldn't even run a, P, a public service announcement saying, and it wasn't even specific. It was very general. You're either for or you're against ending handgun violence. It's as simple as that. If you're for ending handgun violence, you know, uh, uh, and hold, uh, held up that thing saying end handgun violence, you know, uh, right to uh, NCBH, uh, 100 Maryland Avenue, uh, and Northeast. Sort of and they, time oh, more than, no, more than that, they wouldn't run it. They just wouldn't. So what I mean, was that the excuse? They no, they're saying it's political as opposed to uh, charitable, and it is. It's, it's, it's a not a. I mean, you try to say, I'm giving you something. This is a charity, okay? I'm giving you a chance to save your life, ass, you know? And then the, uh, this little thing, this charity? Well, hell with them. So, I mean, you have about as much chance of having a telephone. The only way to have what you're thinking of is what we're trying to do in Washington, which is have a massive concert rally. And that way every media you know, will cover it, and there'll be a show, and we'll run the show for profit. Mm -hmm. 
and that will get the money to form the PAC to make infinite and negate the powers of the NRA. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Step by step by step by step. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting boring, too, because uh, you only have so much energy to give to things like that, and I'm getting tired. It's wearing me down. It's been a number of years since you began singing <laughs> songwriting. Oh. This is a segue. <laughs> this is one of those infamous transitions we've so much about. Um, can you recall way back when the original inspiration, the original impetus to move in that direction? Yeah, listening to the radio at night. There's this guy named... Uh, I've never been asked that question. You know, you're talking about the mm -hmm. that one. Yes. Yeah, well, there's this guy named Dick Hug Huggy Boy. You know him? I know you. <clears throat> he used to say, uh, this Dick Hug Huggy Boy, uh, coming at you from 1065 East Vernon Avenue, Vernon and Central, where we have stacks and stacks and racks and racks of records war for your enjoyment here at Dolphin Store, right? And he'd go into his bit, and he used to play Ray Charles, and uh, he'd, uh, he'd pass the picture down. Oh, Ray, oh, Ray, Ray. Uh, can you say a picture of Ray Charles? That's the original. That's the way I like to think of ebony and ivory. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like <laughs> anyway, it takes both the light keys and the dark keys to play the Star Spangled Banner. Don't believe you said that. <laughs> it's a Lenny Bruce line. Uh, anyway, yeah, I remember just listening to the radio. I used to fall asleep and uh, wait for a rate this famous name, a guy with two first names, Ray Charles. You know, and I used to, and I'd wake up. It's beat up old radio. Just the. Uh, they decorated with pictures of you know, Ray Charles and Louis Richard and people. And, uh, and uh, I would wake up at 3 in the morning, wherever I was, and just if I heard uh, him singing, it was uh, like an alarm clock that went on, and there'd be what I say or something, you know. Oh, you know. And then uh, with that, and I uh, bought an album. I said, I forget the first album. I bought a single first. The first single I ever bought was uh, Could This Be Magic by the Dubs. Remember that? You know, who forgets the first single? It's like you know, the first time, you know. And all that stuff. Mm. I used to listen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How old were you at this point now? Oh, I don't know. That I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember how old I am now. But uh, I do remember. Uh, that, was, that was early teens. Uh, you know, what the the period when you start doing that sort of thing. You know, whatever age that is, eleven. So, but I do remember uh, uh, going, yeah, and dreaming. It's like when you put your head under a pillow, you know. And now presenting me doing Al Jolson. So I used to do imitations under the pillow at night, you know, and uh, you start writing songs to the radio, and you hear them, and because you don't remember all the words, you make up words, and then you hear the song again six months later, and you realize you've rewritten the melody, and you're a songwriter, you know, so then a few years go by, and you, you always have a pal or a friend or someone who feels the same way, so you have some sort of a support, you know, I had a friend named Jerry Smith, still have a friend named Jerry Smith, and uh, we still... Uh, you know, we harmonize, we sing and stuff, you know, and um, that uh, 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 pushed me directly into uh, uh, writing songs. At first, you know, you're almost stealing, then you are stealing, and then it's just a refinement of the art of stealing, you know. It's just like, well, it's all been written before, so it's all blues, it's all not blues, but it's all there, and I don't care how many notes they say there are possibilities of, you know, combining on a piano or something. There used to be a guy on the radio called the Tomb Detective, years and years ago. And you're too young. But, uh, uh, his job, <laughs> they had to throw off the air. There were too many plagiarism suits. He'd say, that's from uh, You Are My Sunshine, 19, <laughs> written by the Frame, you know. And uh, it was a popular show, except that uh, uh, everybody said, hey, he's right. That guy stole my tune, you know. And that, I'm not actually a song thief, but I... Uh, but I, I feel like it sometimes, because a lot of times in the studio, as you refer to it, you say, oh, you know, take that bit from Patricia and plug it into this, and say, you're combining used elements, you know. Anyway, okay, that's how that started, and that's where we are today. It, it's I'm writing a very nice song now. What is it? I write two very nice songs right now. One is called Darling, Teach Me to Redneck Tonight, and the other one is called uh, Till I Hold You in My Hand. Uh, Country. Figure, figure that one out. <laughs> well... The second one is, uh, no, the second one's about masturbation. It's until I hold you, you're, you're every girl, you're every woman, everyone I've ever wanted to make love to. You know? <laughs> Great. Masturbation rock. Yeah, well, something like that. Um, this many years past the source, 
And again, that source is so important. We, we, most of us begin, whatever direction we take it in, with that tremendous love for the music on some level. Can you recapture, do you recapture that initial excitement for music itself when you... When, when you hear you something good, you bet, sure. But you especially when you sit down to, to work yourself, whether you're singing or, or writing. Oh, Does sure, sure, sure. Sure. Does it change? Does it modify form? The, the feeling? Mm. Well, the feeling is about the same. I mean, you get high from it. It's just, it's the, why do you think they call it? Mu music is the highest muse. And that's why music is the, uh, the universal language and all that stuff. And then you just get high from it. So it's like, it's like, oh God, what's it like? It's like just saying something funny. Or as Lenny Bruce once said, it's like, it, 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 it's fun to tell a poem in front of everybody. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. sort of slice. It's, just, it's like discovering something and it's like getting the joke first. You know, it's like just finding something that they don't know yet. And you can't, you go, woo, and you rub your hands together mentally, and you're, you're ready to, you know, you, you, know, you know, say, oh, look what I just found. You know, it's like finding a little treasure and saying, hey, look, look, and you want to show somebody and say, here. And, and uh, also, as Lenny Bruce said, they, and for the first time, you know, they don't throw you out of the room. You know, you're not the father, they don't, they don't throw you out of the room. It's okay to be, you know, it's like that. And you feel, so it's an incredible high. And then to take it from, I see, let's say, that little room or piano, to take it from there, into a studio filled with some of the best musicians in the world and sit down and, you know, and just hear it come to life and walk, walk in with nothing and walk out with a piece of plastic which contains this now newly created thing, which is called the record or something, is an amazing feeling. Beats this stuff. I mean, the only reason I drink is because I'm not in the studio. And I only drink when I'm in the studio. <laughs> I don't you bring up a very interesting point. Uh, I'm going to let you get past this point. This is fascinating to me. That talk about levels of creativity. Um, certainly one of the most creative things, perhaps the ultimate creative thing we can do is producing children. You have lovely children, you're very much involved with them, obviously. Yeah. Um, how much of a contribution does that involvement and your experience as a father have in, in your music? Very little. Yeah. Very little. It's almost two separate worlds. Uh, in fact, uh, once, a, once every week or so I've got to go out and get some street <laughs> just to take me away from this. I don't know why that is, but it's like, you know, it's just a like last night, I had this party. I just had to get drunk, and that's why I'm drinking now. Sorry about that. But <laughs> you know, something that can keep uh, relatively lucid, you know. Um, now the children are wonderful, uh, and I, I, I've been very involved with, the, with them since all their lives. <laughs> but um, they have very little to do with. In fact, they get in the way of writing. You know, they don't help. Maybe I'll change my opinion in a year or so and start writing songs about them or something. You know? But it sounds so corny to even think about that, and I can't. You can relate it. I can relate more to, to taking a camera like that, and I filmed the birth of Ben and Annie in our bed, you know. And, and I cut the cord and boiled the water, and at home they were con born where they were conceived. Well, that's interesting. There's bow whistling. <whistles> you never steal from that. <laughs> Call me when you can do that. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't so much thinking in terms of your writing about the children as going through that very creative process might affect they get in your, the way. Own, your own perspective. Well, they get in the way general. of that. They, they definitely get in the way of that. For me, anyway, now. I mean, I might change that in a while, but uh, uh, I don't want to write songs like watching Scotty grow, you know. I just, uh, no offense whoever wrote that, you know, but uh, you know what I mean? Mac Davis is that? Or, Davis. Uh, did you write it? That was Mac Davis. <laughs> Hi, Mac. But the idea is, I still want to write a song, <laughs> isn't it cute? Isn't it, isn't it? On the other hand, Stevie Wonder, isn't she lovely? You know, that's sure? different. So you can do whatever you want with it, I guess. But to me, I find them to be an interruptive pain in the ass. I like playing with them in the room, playing the piano with them. I mean, I asked them both, but they said, what can we do for your birthday? Yeah. And um, so much of writing their song. Right? So Bo's going, I'm writing my song. To the three-year-old, you say, and Ben goes, you know, doing <laughs> the Laurel and Hardy, right? So, <laughs> or doing the Laurel. And, that's a nice idea. Do the Laurel and Hardy, and you go, do 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 do. It sure is. Boom, da. You know, <laughs> so no use stopping nip with you moron. Anyway, uh, they get. I think they're, they're a creative pain in the ass, and I like to be by myself when I do that. And uh, maybe someday I'll change my opinions. But uh, right now, that's how I feel about it. They get in the way. Although I love them with all my heart, as you know, and I, we built this house of whimsy for them. We got 
this is a playhouse, you know, you can't tell much from this empty bookshelf in the Penguins, but upstairs is very nice. Maybe we'll take a look around with the camera later. It'll be nice for them to, you know. and, uh, uh, and they love me and I love them and we all love each other. We have a great time. I spend most of my time in bed watching TV and holding on to them real tight, you know. And, uh, but there's nothing to do with songwriting. <laughs> if anything, they get in the way. Okay. We, we're just... Um, <laughs> I say, my children will hate me. <laughs> Let me, let me, well, let me, let me clarify that off mic. All, what I really, again, was asking... Clarify it off mic. But they don't need me. They're not going Who? to use me. Anybody. This is, I'm never going to be... Yes, this is history. Don't oh, you want a copy of it? Yes. I expect it <laughs> What? I want it in triplicate. Oh. Um, Xeroxes. Again, I'm not thinking so much, and I wasn't thinking so much of your writing about the children, as being a father and watching the children grow and being involved in it might change your perspective on the rest of the world and other involvements. Um, if that's not a valid concept, I'll... No, uh, my, my opinions haven't changed much since I was about 10. You know, I still like, I laugh at the same things. I still like Laurel and Hardy. I still like Lenny and Bruce. I still like the Everly Brothers and Little Richard. And I still like, uh, I've always liked uh, kids and children. I hate to call them kids. I still like I always love children. And, uh, you know, my opinions don't really change much after a certain, I mean, some people develop this mask and they wear it. Like I'm wearing the Schmilson outfit today because I'm hungover and I don't want to be serious, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's also a nice disguise because it lets you talk readily, easily, you know. Because a, but uh, you don't really change much because of children. I mean, your values don't really change. Your values are established when you're about six months old. <laughs> you know, it's, it's ridiculous how early your values are established. Mm -hmm, loud noise, no. <laughs> you know. Well, it's pretty true. The values themselves, I think, could maybe start around, I don't know, they say between two two and something, two and three and four, they sort of learn. Um, you know? In the first five years, we've gotten most the, of the... Yeah, they're, they're shortening step. that down, though. You know, mm -hmm. come away, it used to be five years, it used to be seven years, it used to be 21 years. Like <laughs> my aunt used to say children should be born when they're 21. She had a point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't have it any other way. We're just... Sorry, I almost broke into song. I'm sorry. I won't do it. Well, that's okay. Well, okay. <laughs> We're just now beginning the second quarter century of the rock era. Is that right? Yes. Oh. I knew you were waiting for me so long to tell you this. I didn't know that. I never thought of it in those terms. Second quarter century. Yeah, 25 years is an interesting point of view. I mean, obviously, for so long, uh, beginning at the what's beginning. What's 25 from 82? What, oh, I can't possibly do that. Oh, all right. <laughs> I think you're 1955, right? About 55. All right, 65, 75. 80, so it's 27 years. So it's 27 then, if yeah. you started to 55. Yeah. yeah. There was some rock and roll before that, but okay. You think of Bill Haley and Shaboom? Or well, generally speaking, I mean, it's so loosely defined. Anybody who tries to put a label on anything, I think, is peculiar. But oh, for yeah? Practical purposes. Why do you think the Smithsonian <laughs> calls, uh, you know, the father of television is, don't you? Oh, gosh. I'm Philo T. Farnsworth. I didn't know that. I didn't know. It's like uh, <laughs> Ronan Martin. Right. Um, <laughs> my Roman Martin impression. But the, from, the, from the moment we started talking about rock and roll is rock and roll, there had been people saying, well, it's not going to last. And what was interesting is that even those people who were making the music... Well, it's not. They're right. ...traditionally have said, well, of course, you know, this is only what I'm going to do until I grow up and go straight and get a job. John Lennon, <laughs> of course, talking about he's not going to be playing rock and roll when he's 30. All of a sudden, a lot 40. of us are finding out, right, that... Hey, this is in fact what we're doing with our lives. It is our lives, um, and it's going to go on. Has there been much of that discovery for you and that realization? I was a late starter. I didn't start till I was 28. That would have given me two years by his theory. You know, I mean, it's, it's silly. You know, it's all rock and roll. Doesn't look at Ray Charles. I mean, is he not doing rock and roll? I saw him in Spain last year. I mean, it's amazing. Even little Richard on his, doing his God bit is like amazing. He's still doing rock and roll. Hold on, won't you please? You know, all, ah. Tell me uh, about little Richard. What do you want to know? He's very tall. Tell me what you think of his music. And what you think of him? I think he's the greatest singular vocalist, you know, single vocalist in the world, greatest vocalist of all time. Really? I mean, yeah, that includes Caruso and everybody else. Why? What made Because no one else can do what he did. <laughs> it's that simple. He's that good, and he hit some notes that are just incomparable. The only guy I heard come close to it, not, first of all, there's only one white guy, I think it was Fogarty, uh, from um, Creedence, who came close to him, you know, and that's why I can't think of anybody else. I know there must be people out there, you know, 
who do it. I just don't know them. And I just, I hear people trying desperately to do him or Ray Charles, and they just don't do it. They can't cut it, you know. But I certainly have influenced a tremendous number of people. It's not just the influence. I just happen to think he's the finest vocalist in history. <laughs> I haven't heard anybody better than him. And Ray Charles is maybe the other one, and, but it just doesn't get much better. Can you know? I throw some other names at you? Sure. Let me get some kind of impressionistic canvas type oh, okay. <laughs> um, perspectives on some of these people, and their perhaps their contribution or their impact on their lives. Elvis Presley. <coughs> Never bought an album. Never liked the albums, but I love the singles, and I love this. Uh, <laughs> his presence, let me put it that way. Interesting, how do you mean that? Well, it's going to be taken both ways. His presence is a present, you know, or was a present, you know. We need Elvis Presley from time to time. Mm -hmm. You know, guys that go out there and have his army supporting George Wallace, you know, on the one hand and singing Love Me Tender, and you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all that corn that goes with it. And I think uh, he's a remarkable man, a phenomenon, but uh, I never liked his albums. What was best I always thought I could do that anyway. <laughs> what was best about the music that you liked? The singles, you know. Well, you know, what I can't You know, all that, and, and uh, all those tunes, the singles are incredible. <laughs> well, not all of them, but I mean, yeah, some of the early singles are amazing. Just amazing. You know. But that's it for Elvis. Same with the Stones. I never liked to wreck the albums, just the, the singles. Some, you know, some of the singles are incredible, but just the albums I never cared for, you know. Really? Yeah. Right. Um, Why? But everybody loved Buddy Holly. I mean, you can't. Buddy Holly's just like the guy who wears glasses and makes rock and roll. You know, <laughs> you know, you gotta like Buddy Holly. <laughs> because he wears glasses and makes rock and My roll. My friend Jerry Smith I mentioned earlier. He he he, he said uh, uh, we used to do tubes of his. Maybe baby, I'll have you Sunday. You know, it's funny, honey. You don't care. You know, and all those tunes. But every day, the first guy used a Celeste in rock and roll, man. You know. <laughs> How many people know that? I just made it up. I believe we're getting a, a signal that we have to... <laughs> huh? Wait a minute, Una wants to be a star. She's I've got some blanks, it. by the way. Three quarter? Oh, three quarter, what am I talking about? No. Okay, this is a short one, ten minutes. Okay, I actually saw your arm this time. <laughs> <laughs> So Buddy Holly, who was next? Was Buddy Holly, well, the song, the line in Don McLean's American Pie, uh, <laughs> so yeah, often yeah. repeated. Watching yeah. Scotty Grill. Yeah, right. My um, baby, your baby, its baby. Yeah. Was that a schlock line? I think they're all schlock lines. Who was Vincent anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Did he really care about Vincent? Vincent's been dead a hundred years. Leave him alone. Oh, Benny. It's like Carly Simon's lyrics, you know. You walked into the party like you were walking onto a yacht. Your scarf, it was apricot. What? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Carly, I love you, but, you know. <clears throat> Remember the time you and Mick Jagger and I tried to do harmonies to your Sylvain? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, it's true. I'm in the background there. According to Richard Perry, I'm still on it. I can only hear this one go, like that. Yeah, I sang with... I had to leave the room, though, because uh, I figured out between Richard Perry, Carly Simon, and uh, Mick Jagger, there were nine pounds of lips in the room. And I had these little, I had this no-mouth thing that just talks loud, man. And they're going, yo, 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 you know, jeez, i got to leave, Richard. This is not my place, you know, I don't belong. You were out-lipped? I was out-lipped, oh, but no. never ad-libbed. No, never ad-libbed. No. Favorite song by Benny Hunt? Favorite song? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's tough. Uh, every day, and maybe those two I just m m mentioned out. But all of them, Peggy, so, I mean, all these things, amazing songs. Do you still have an influence on contemporary? I think so. Yeah, sure. Look at Elvis Costello, you know. <laughs> okay. if, if he's contemporary, maybe he's passe now, too. I still wear my bathrobe. I, I'm unchangeable. That's why I wear bathrobes, you know. No, I didn't know. Hey, that. you can't date yourself with a bathrobe. This is possible, too, unless it's an old fashioned bathtub. Bathrobe. Does plaid. that tell you what year it was done in? Sure. Remember the old plaid bathrobes? I've worn old plaid bathrobes, but you can you buy know. them today. This well, is a very contemporary bathrobe. Is it? It's very contemporary. How many years ago did I buy this bathrobe? This is the third one I've had like this. Are you turning it off now? Oh, you want to turn it on? Putting it on the spot, eh? No, I'm trying to think. Well, you may have had that one for 
pretty ratty looking, isn't it? Yeah, I love this. Is the third one I've had. So how contemporary is it? It, it makes its own time. Look, Thirty years from now, they look back and they'll say, "Oh, what? A, oh, this bath was from 1973, isn't it? I can tell." Oh, but they didn't have. As opposed to, as opposed to, look, this isn't semi velour. This is just an old wool. Well, it's not velour at all. No, it's Feel it. mock velour. Feel it. It's not it's mock velour. Supposed to look like it. It's supposed to look like mock velour. No, it's just been washed a lot. I mean, uh. no, Oh, God, you can't even convince anybody about your bathrobe preferences these days. But you're making a good attempt. Am I? I'm impressed. Yeah. Why don't you believe me? I do. Okay. Now look, I can show you know, albums. Easy, you know. I can show you albums. Well, there's always a way of spotting, you know, what year you something know. was done. But as an example, you know, that wasn't done, or it could have been done in 1980, you know, but or it could have. The point is, um, I was really making a simple reference to... Uh, why bathrobes? You know, because if you're wearing something, if you wear glitter, that tells you what year it came from. If you dress up like Elvis Costello, that tells you what year it came from. You know, okay. you can't confuse it with the '50s because it is their color. You know, they're just ways of spotting. And the same token, you know, a long time from now they'll have a hard time saying what year was that bathrobe made. <laughs> That's all. So it keeps you timeless, is what I'm saying. Will they care? <laughs> I will. I'm sure they'll care. There's always someone who cares. I mean. It's like you can't walk down the street. If you jumped into a, a sewer tomorrow and you tried to starve yourself to death, some clown would come along and pour hot soup down you. If, if somebody cares, believe me. That was sort of the, uh, one of the messages in uh, um, Oh Lucky Man. Mm. A brilliant dramatization of a philosophy of despair, he said at the top of his hat. I love him again. Bob Dylan. Hell of a wonderful, wacky kind of a guy. Real bowl of laughs. A bowl of laughs. Um, are you tired yet of hearing that he was a spokesman for his generation? First of all, I think I was as much of a spokesman for his generation as he was. Well, What's his generation? Is he older or younger? I forget. What is he now? He's, uh, I have no idea. I think he's 40. a Christian. No, it's up higher. It's up higher? Right there. All right, he's a super Christian. Oh. Yeah, he's a Christian. Can <laughs> <laughs> you that an E? Sure. You are, I love it. That's a Different e, I pitch? think. No. Hum the note and I'll tell you. Da. I think that's a G. Do you really? Mm -hmm. You got a piano we can test. I know. I've got almost. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Alright. Mm -hmm. You think it's a G? I think so. Well, we'll find out later. It's on tape, you know. <laughs> oh, God, I could be wrecked for life. No, you couldn't. <laughs> No, it's just that when he took speed, I thought he wrote some of the most brilliant words in the world, you know. In fact, I recorded one of his tunes, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues. Mm -hmm. It's always been my favorite, you know. And uh, but personally, I don't know, I find him to be a bit of a hypocrite, especially when it comes to guns and things and peace and uh, Christianity. Hypocrite how, specifically? Well, specifically, I asked him, I asked him through Kelvin if he didn't call me back. I, I know Bob only a little bit, you know. But I don't think anybody knows him very well. But Keltner, Jim Keltner knows him very well. And I said, help us with the gun thing, you know? And uh, Jim finally called me back and said, you know, uh, well, Bob feels like he's a bit of a hypocrite because uh, he has guns. And I said, oh, well, then he is a hypocrite. What's, all, what's Christianity got to do with guns? Stop being a Jewish Christian and get rid of your guns, you know? So I have not much time for him these days. Even though we both stood on the stage the other day at the Peace Sunday, don't drop the big one. Run down to the refrigerator, get yourself a salami cheese sandwich from the fifties, you know. And, hey, and then, uh, but don't forget, I have a gun. What the hell's that about? I don't care. See, I don't want to know. So I have no time for him except for that, where he just did histrionics. Uh, the man who so often compared in contemporary sense to Dylan, Bruce Springsteen. I don't know much about Bruce Springsteen. I, I like, I, when I see him on TV, I, I like him very much. He bounces around good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the music hasn't quite gotten to you. Let's go back in time. Wait I just don't listen. I don't buy albums, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I've never bought a Dylan album, an Elvis Presley album, a Rolling Stone album, a Bruce Springsteen album. I bought Ray Charles albums. I buy collection albums on TV about 1-800-257-1257. Well, some of them get that against the door. Yep, I hear the patter of... Five-year-old feet, <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Uh, uh, anyway, any, any others? I like this. This is the best interview I've done in a long time. Gosh. Because I like being able to say this. Do you? Yeah. Oh, good. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm pleased to be enjoying it. Let me turn the tape over then, so that you can. Uh... Don't forget, it's only got two minutes <coughs> of film left. Change your tape too. <coughs> I have a terrible could, uh, desire to keep turning around and looking at you and making funny faces. I really want to make one. It's okay. I've got a couple minutes. Do you? And then one more tape? Okay. Um, the Grateful Dead. Are they? <laughs> I don't know. I've learned to say again, I've never, bought, I've never owned an album. I don't buy albums, is my point. But are you aware of their music without having to buy the album? Uh, you hear it here and there, and, I, and it's, it's all sounds good and, and the same to me. And they seem like nice guys. That I like that quality. They come across as nice people. They scared me when I first heard of them. You know, like some guys scare you. Who's who's uh, not Bruce, who's uh, who's Jimi Hendrix? I and mean, he scared me. There's this black guy coming on doing. Pound, and later on, you realize you know he could be the greatest guitar player in history. You know, <laughs> when he plays the Star Spangled Banner, you go, oh, I got to stand now. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, some people scare you, and somebody calls themselves the Grateful Dead, you know, it's like the Hell's Angels, they come at you, you know, and you don't know where the hell they're coming from, you know, angels or not. But after a while, you see, you finally see interviews, and you say, I like them, you know, you see them on TV, and, and the man just waved his arm. Well, he does that a lot, doesn't he? Fred has been famous for... I'll put this microphone oh, back on. Yeah, <laughs> First, I'll get a drink. Taping been... your bathrobe. I'm starting to walk with the penguin. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me about Grace Slick when we left off. Yeah? What about her? What about her? Tell me. No, I was, I was doing an invitation of her, you know. And this pill gets you tall, and this pill gets you small, and this pill gets you crazy, and this one doesn't do anything at all, and it's okay, you know what I mean? Who cares? I didn't even like the pretentiousness of, and Alice knew what she was doing, and so what, you know. In fact, the, I thought in the airplane were pretty boring. I find most people boring. I find uh, much easier to talk about the minority of people I find less boring. Laura Nero, Randy Newman, John Lennon, uh, a few of those. You know, then they used to talk about the boring people. But I don't mind saying they're all boring to me. They've had it said about them before, and they'll have it said about them again. And I've had it said about me, and I know what it feels like, and so do they, so it's all okay. And to some extent, we all bore one another anyway, right? Yeah, to an extent, you know. I'm not boring you, am I? Oh, good. You're not boring me either. Really? Yes. So far, so good. It's like this. Am I boring you? Oh, I yeah, you are That's now. I'm going to charge you for that whole. Um, that movie <laughs> you know what they'd call you if you did? <laughs> no. A whole charger. No. <laughs> I like the movie blues. I like the movie blues. I, I sure like the, those two great records, you know, whatever they were. <laughs> Nights nice and White Sands. Yeah. And, and the other one. Uh, Days of Future Past. That was the album, wasn't it? That was it? the album. Yeah. But the single in it, the, uh, the, this is about the ship, you know. It's always that the thing, da da da, or is that the other group? Oh, you're not thinking of Sloop John B, but No, no, <laughs> no. I heard the captain say, is that the other group or is that them? Oh, no, no. Sorry. It's sounding familiar and not. That's Smokey, you really got a hold. Oh, no. That's the one. What is that? It's about, about the ship. You know, I heard the captain say. Sorry. Maybe it wasn't even them. I don't know. But I liked them I, very much. But they were very, they were ahead of their time. In what respect? Musically, I mean, they, do, they had better echo than the other guys. Guys doing stuff. You know, they were not Phil Spector. Hello. Better echo, but what about the quality? That's what I'm talking about. What about the symphonic? Well, that's what I'm talking. I mean, that's what I meant. You know, it's more lasagna. More stuff. Okay. How about Jim Morrison and the Doors? Grows on you after he's dead for a long time. It's grown on a lot of people after he's dead. That's what I mean, yeah. And it's true, I just, that, that happened. It's, it's true of a lot of uh, uh, artists, you know, they, they hit you after the dead. There's a resurgence, as you know, a popularity. You know, kids were really obviously too young to recall Morrison from when he was really here and doing it. Um, and of course, there's this bizarre legend that's grown up. Still being alive somewhere. Um, In Argentina with Paul. With Paul, right? Why? Why the legend? And him? I don't know. People, people make it up. I haven't had a cigarette in an hour. I'm not looking for a cigarette. You got a cigarette? Nine twelve. Oh. <laughs> no. First of all, yeah. I like it. The other one is, if you take the cellophane, you know, and you burn a hole in it, you know that one. Yeah, blow some smoke in it. 
lazy man smoking is gonna do. <laughs> I could have just sent a message to Chief Dan George. Or to Mayor. <laughs> Never lose you. I think they did yeah, Bula Brian. I think I think they did six girls' names in their songs. I always say it's something about Randy Newman, I, 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 I dearly respect. Uh, you know. But is, is that a right word? Dearly respect, what does it sound like? Gay. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, I respect Randy a lot, you know, and uh, I always think that if he runs out of girls' names or city titles, he's in trouble, you know. But he seems to come back with things like short people, which is all right. You know? Favorite song in the last ten years? Oh, it's one of mine too, I think. He's written better, oh, he's, he's like Marie. Brilliant. He's just brilliant. Yes, he is. Okay. I'm jealous of him. Let's go get him. <laughs> what do you say? And steal everything he's got. Yeah, he'll all be he'll songs. be had by his own uh, cynicism. He'll probably outlive me, but that's okay. Hi, Ran. <laughs> <laughs> Remember me? I'm the guy who did the high notes in your album. I'm not going to let you get away from the doors yet. Tell me oh, more the doors, about yes. Let me close them. Why, why this legend has grown up around Morrison? Well, it's the same. Oh, I think it's the same reason the legend has grown up. But anybody's dead young, you know. I mean, if they're famous. Uh, there's a there's a thing about I don't know something about. Uh, I was, I, I call it the swarm theory, you know, I assume we're all alive, you know, we're all in motion somehow. And that's all, that's about all we know, you know. We are here, therefore we think we're Descartes, you know, whoever. And so uh, we know that since we're in motion, we don't know where we're going, but we are in motion, in X the unknown, you know. And we find that uh, uh, each of us in turn X, I hate to use this word, but it works uh, as like a little light, you know, or a firefly or something. If you picture a swarm of fireflies going through the universe, you know, and each one is capable of emitting a brighter light or a lesser light or so on and so forth. And uh, on one hand, you have an Adolf Hitler or Jesus Christ or, a, you know, a left and a right. And so on. when they illuminate themselves, they act as retro rockets and they fire and um, they affect the destination or the direction of the swarm. You know, so it's the, the swarms obligation or duty to extinguish those lights early so that we don't, uh, so we find it's inefficient to zigzag away through time. The straightest line is the fastest and we don't know where we're going, we're going to get there fast for some reason. So we find that, let's do this for a hundred years. No, that's, that's a zigzag, if I can't zigzag, okay, let's try this for a hundred years. No, nope. so they extinguish this light and they extinguish that light and let history decide whether or not they made the right decisions. As a result, uh, you'll notice a lot of famous people uh, who have influential lights have been extinguished early. You know. As a result, legends spring up about them and carry on for, <laughs> for the future generations to decide whether or not we were correct in assassinating a John Kennedy, let's say, or, or a John Lennon, or a Pope, or a, you know what I mean? So uh, it's our job, shall we accept it, to extinguish these lights in the name of efficiency, trying to get to X the unknown. It sounds like madness, but that's the way it seems to work. Therefore, when you have someone who dies young, this is a popular idiom, using a popular idiom, uh, like a, a Morrison or a, or a Lenin or someone like that. Um, uh, I, the reason I included Hitler was because he died prematurely too. He was only in his 50s. That was Neil Diamond song. It sounds like a Neil Diamond song? I said something that sounds like a Neil Diamond song? It's not. Holy, 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 holy. Anybody steal some Mozart that badly? Watch out. Neil Diamond. Remember Neil when you did that thing about uh, what is it? Uh, da, 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 no, what is it? Uh, song, song, okay. blue. Everybody knows my. Mo Mo Mozart. Mozart wrote it this way. Dun, dun, bum, da, 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 da. That's the way it's supposed to go, Neil. Just in case you're listening. <laughs> it says PD. Um. I don't mean police department, because they bust in for stealing that sucker. What, uh, what about the music of the... I don't know. I just, I just like the way he sang. He was the first of the drolls, you know what I mean? And, uh, nah, 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 you know, and, and light my fire and all those things. I, I like that. At the time, I wasn't that crazy about it, because I didn't think he could sing. But then listening now, it's like you, you pay attention after, like with Elvis. You know, you learn more about it after he's dead. After I'm gone. You're going to miss me. I'll probably learn something about Frank Sinatra someday. That'll make me like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs>
There goes another kill of what? Hey, Julie loves you more than you will know. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about the, uh, the jazz influences of that group in terms of expanding solos and all things concerned. Do you buy that? Yeah, I do. In fact, I've got a tape I could play in a, in a minute so that you won't believe it. It's the first thing I've heard in the 80s that makes sense. It's like an all synthesizer band doing Kansas City. Play, it was singing. Yeah, it's, it's wild. <laughs> Did I play that for you, Fred? I mean, I just, I just think it's incredible. I mean, it just floors me every time I hear it. Can we talk about the Beatles? Sure. Maybe Which ones? Let's talk about all of them. First oh, the nine former Fifth X Beatles in the USA, or the other ones? <laughs> the other ones, yeah. The other ones, the uh, Fab Four. Fab Three. Um, well, let's go back beyond that. Let's go back to. Let's go back to the. Let's four. go back to Pete Best in that sad interview we did on this. What was it Tomorrow Show or something? Oh, recently. Right all, yeah, Entertainment Tonight, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. They had him here pushing those. It was uh, very sad. Was it? Very sad. What happened? I didn't know. Well, first of all, he said he was a better drummer than Ringo, which is impossible. And secondly, he said, <laughs> he said, you can see he was sort of scary, but he was like resolute in his, in his he works for a government thing, and he, and, he, and he was just saying, the sad part was when he said, you know, he says, you know, 62, and they had this graphic thing going on in the background, he showed, you know, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, he says, you know, for a couple of years, you know, I was there, and they used to, they used to have these, uh, everywhere you'd go, you'd see John, Paul, George, and Pete, you know. <laughs> Oh, okay. Something's, something is wrong. Well. Yeah, that's strange. All right. Um, well, I guess we, we lost a bunch of stuff, but oh well. You have it on the second side of you. You'll get a cassette Thank in you. the mail. Merry yeah. Christmas. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. The Beatles, you Can you hear this from here, do you think? <laughs> well, I move the microphone over. That way I can lean, that way I can lean back. That. Hi. <laughs> this, that's, that's a great scene. Like I just, <laughs> his hair goes up there. <laughs> Hello. Earth. Seems to be a, your bangy in the wood pile. There are so many non musical people, critics oh. and others, who have sought to define the Beatles and the music and the contributions and all that. Um, to a certain extent, I find myself thinking no one's going to wind up being able to say anything profound or even accurate. So oh, I don't we know. all have something accurate because we have our own <laughs> personal involvement, and I think that's very important. From a perspective of a musician, as well as someone just on a, on the level of listening, talking yes. about the music. It speaks for itself. Thank you. It's that good. It's like Ray Charles or Little Richard. It's just that good. What they did was they, in addition to having melody, they had harmony. They sang. They wrote. They played. They uh, uh, they had this, the names John Paul George and Jones, you know. And it was like there it was, it was America was waiting for John Paul George and Jones, you know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, even the name Ringo is an American name. You know, when you think about Ringo, it's like it has a little touch to it. It's just perfect. He was the beat behind the Beatles. They called them the Beatles. He was the beat. Well, that's what you're talking. You know? You're talking about the Pete Best interview. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, but uh, that, the saddest part we were talking about was that when he said uh, he used to, used to sing his name, you know, John, Paul, George, and Pete. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right, does it? And he's going, well, you know, then all of a sudden, this is guy I knew and I liked, he said, you know, and, and, and there he is. And, and the guy asked him point blank, he says, well, do you think you're as good a drummer? He says, oh, yeah, on a given day, you know, I'd win, I'd, I'd take it, you know, or something like that. And, I, and, he, and they played a, a track that he did. He's got an album out, evidently. At, uh, under these demos or something, and which he deserves. I mean, you know. He's pushing the Decca audition tapes. Is what that's what it is. Yeah, Decca audition tapes, and, and that's fine. I, I see no harm in that. In fact, I think it's part of history. He should do it, and I think he should make a buck as well. I mean, he was there for a bit. Whether it was good or bad, he was there. I think he deserves a, a round of applause. Let's stand up and give him a round. Here, Pete. <laughs> you know, but he's not Ringo. There's never going to be another one like him. He's the only guy who's two-fisted drummer. Just boom, 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 you know, and bam. When he plays, you you hear him. He's there. He makes the things that drummers will be copying for a hundred years. I mean, he is that good. I hate it when guys say, you know, is he really a good drummer? You know, are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, are you nuts? The guy's amazing. He plays drums better than anybody. His, the great line he had once was about Buddy Rich. He said, he said, um, Granted, the man is fast. <laughs> yeah.
you. Wonderful. <laughs> Perhaps the problem is that, that Ringo never seems to spend, spend much time selling himself to somebody else. Oh, no, he's the biggest salesman in the world. Him, him and, he and John, I think, were, well, I don't, that's hard to say. <laughs> But no, he's a great salesman. He's out there pushing his albums. He sells. He works for everybody. I mean, if he does a gig, he's out there. You know, he'll sell himself for uh, any dumb producer in the world to go out and push him. We push Caveman. He did every goddamn show in America to push Caveman, which I thought was a great seven-year-old, you know, seven-year-olds movie, you know. <laughs> but and uh, I think yeah, that's what, what it was. I enjoy it now on, on uh, cable. And John was one of the greatest show business cats in the world. He was a terrific. Tremendous salesman. He understood media. I mean, he, he understood media. media totally. I mean, he was the showman. I mean, he was no one like him. I mean, he was <laughs> I w but I want to take you further into the emotional response during, say, the, the mid 60s. Do I have to get deeper? Oh, I want you to get very deep. Yeah, oh, okay. Seriously deep. <laughs> okay. Um, when you were wherever you were, in a car, uh, in the house, listening to the radio, and during that period of two or three years when every time a new Beatle record would hit, we all gathered around the radio. What yeah. were some of the thoughts when you heard those new songs? I was very jealous. And I, uh, um, I didn't like them at first. I said, oh, yeah, show me what you got. You know, it was one of those, and they did. Mm. But because uh, I could hear all the influences, and I could hear like a, I could hear Paul doing things like, you know, uh, uh, Bruce Chanel, you know, I want to know. You know. It's true, the, uh, the car on the way over. Is that right? Yeah. Hey, there we are. In fact, Ringo recorded that. Ringo's only problem is he has two problems. He yells at my son too loudly, and he sometimes, I think it's starting to go to his head, frankly, being a Beatle. Now? Yeah. <laughs> Why? I'm afraid this is a straight line. Oh, I don't know. He has a different excuse. <laughs> He's got great, great excuses for uh, uh, saying no to autographs. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not going to meet with him. <laughs> you, 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 you wouldn't give you an autograph? <coughs> I don't know. I've never actually asked him for one, except on albums for other people to sell to stop guns, you know. <laughs> but, um, no, he's, on the one hand, he's very generous. On the other hand, he's pretty a tight-fisted mother. I mean, he just, I could tell you a story about Monte Carlo. Remember that one? And, um, <laughs> but, but I've, I've watched him say no to people in so many different ways. I mean, I see, there are a few people in the world who, who can crack me up involuntarily. I mean, that to, me, to make you laugh involuntarily, you know. Uh, one was John, uh, Lenny Bruce, Lauren Hardy, and Ringo. I mean, just make you laugh. Albert Brooks, another one. Just make you laugh whether you want to. Or, I mean, you could be sitting there with a hurt foot, and then they'll just say something like, oh, no, it's only whatever, and boom, crack you up, take away your blues, <laughs> make you laugh. Yeah. He's one. He's that fast, you know. Huh? Okay, I was coming what you're saying. Back to the songs. Mm. Mention some specific songs. You loved, and tell me why. Oh God, I don't know. Uh, uh, what comes to mind first? Uh, I can't stand the rain. It's my window. It was, I want to hold your hand, you know. And I'm older. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's no such thing as a favorite Beatles song. That's I just favorite. like asking somebody, what's your favorite uh, hand? Not favorite. You know, your favorite right. finger. You know? Not favorite. I want you to just recall some that you liked and why. Oh, that's too tough. I, 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 uh, if you force me, I'll just say I, I, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, How about remembering the response to an album like Rubber Soul or Revolver? All, that, all those things, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, no, I'm trying to think. Uh, 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 now, let, me, let me lead you on. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, let me lead you astray, someone mentioned to me that the Beatles first became very turned on about you after hearing your version of Can't Buy Me Love. Is that true? Well, I didn't do Can't Buy Me Love. So that's interesting. Uh, no, that not somebody told you. <laughs> Oh, well, no? I never heard it. You never did it? No. Not that I know of. No. But there are a lot of uh, selective rumors. blackouts in my life, you know. I love, I love wrong rumors. Okay, here's another one for you. You like the group, too? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no. Um, Blackbird. That you had done a, a I did a of version of Blackbird. <coughs> and I did, <coughs> no, I have, there's a tape somewhere, Paul and I, uh, Paul came over the house one night with uh, Linda. Uh, he, he called, asked if, uh, he called, you know, Derek Taylor is a great, a lot of great things to say about the Beatles, and, uh, in addition to coining, you know, the mop. Oh, yeah. The Alternative Society's cheerleader. Indeed. I got it. <laughs> Give us a B. Give us an A. Give us an N. What do you got? Even as we speak, they are having... Sure.
She's wonderful, don't get me wrong, she's a wonderful human being. So is her, so it's on Hayden. So, so you could, right there. So we could watch no, it's just video. You know? But uh, yeah, a lot of guys do that. In fact, okay. Where were we? Okay, well, you were telling the story about uh, Paul and oh, Blackbird. Yeah. No, well, and, and Blackbird. Well, there's a tape somewhere, uh, back to the tapes on uh, Paul called and uh, it was during that period when Derek Taylor was saying, you know, and uh, it was a period when, when, when something had to be done. They said, well, let's get the finest band in the land, you know, and they'd get the finest band in the land, you know, and they'd do it. So Paul, when he did uh, Mary Hopkins, so let's go. Well, let's get all bunch of let's get a bunch of sing songwriters, you know, and get them all together and call Harold, you know, and do that stuff. And uh, and, and Randy, call Randy and call me and call a whole bunch of people. And, so everybody was supposed to write a tune for Mary. And at the time, it was not only an honor and a privilege, because you knew it's history and all that, but it was, uh, it's also sort of like, it's fun to write on assignment, you know, overnight. Can you have a song for Mary tomorrow? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, Paul expects those people. All right. I happened to have been in London and had a little piano. So I wrote the song and sent it to him, or played it for him on the phone, rather, and uh, through Derek uh, from Apple, after the Hells Angels left. <laughs> And the memories just come flooding back, and uh, so we went, fantastic, how you it's, it's great, you know. What are you doing tonight? I said nothing. He says, mind if we pop in? You know. So I said, oh great. You know, so he popped in with his left-handed guitar, you know. And he and Linda and, and my former wife Diane and I sat down with this little cassette machine like this one, and uh, uh, we started just jamming and singing and stuff. And he had all these new songs. I had no new songs, with the exception of the. The one I had written for Mary Hopkins. I was thinking at the time of doing a, a commercial for a car. I forget what it was. That's all I had. Anyway, so he started, says, oh, I've got these songs. He played on this tape, and we're harmonizing drunk. You know, we're doing Blackbird, Teddy Boy. She came in through the bathroom window, and a fourth. I forget what it was. But they appeared like on three different albums. So there's this great tape someplace. <laughs> I don't have a copy of it. I think my ex-wife probably burned it in, in a spirit of hatred. But uh, huge, hot, heaping hunks of hatred. And uh, only kidding, dear. You know, still love you. How are the babies? And uh, uh, so there is that. And I also, once I cut isolation, uh, just to see what it was, how it was constructed for some reason. I was, I was just, you know, I was out of my brains when I in the studio. I just went in and, you know, just, uh, people say we got it, me. Don't they know we're so afraid? I, I. Such a great, you know, the way it's. Isolation. It's so backwards. It works. I don't know why, <laughs> you know, but it's really there. It was. You know. So I said, it's like one time I was so fascinated by uh, Penny Lane that when I was working at a computer center, we had a conference room with a green board, you know, a blackboard with, a, with green. Were, what they call green boards, blackboards. You know. And uh, I remember taking a piece of chalk and illustrating it, you know, the whole thing with the fire engine and the barber shop and the thing, just. To, and I, and I called some people into the conference room. I said, do you see what, you know what that is? And they went, Penny Lane. I went, right. <laughs> and just that, that flow, just that bunch of images was so so good, you know, that you just, uh, you know, what can you say other than after you've said, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're all good at that. <laughs> it's not easy being the fifth world's tallest blonde former ex-Beatle from the USA, you know. <laughs> We all have crushed. It's being the world's tallest leprechaun either, but there we are. There's also a Solomon. It's a Mexican leprechaun. There's, no, it's true. There's a guy. Uh, his name is John S uh, Solomon, and he's a. Uh, um, he's a I noticed his name <laughs> at the fight. The Cooney. This will date this tape. Last night was the Cooney uh, Holmes yeah. fight. It was a great fight. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I like boxing. Uh, Do you? Yeah. Why? Well, because it's a uh, man against man. It's the it against it. It's athlete against athlete. It's a it's a form. It's just like music. It's note against note. It's thing against thing. It's like any sport. You know, uh, is it sporting football. Bash someone's brains out where the purpose is to bash his brains out? The purpose is not to bash the brains out. That's why they wear soft gloves. If they want to do that, they use hammers. You know, <laughs> the point is to see if they can outbox the other, outfox the other. The idea is to see, how, you know, if you can, can you beat his brains out, but can you do it with cool? <laughs> do it with style, do it with grace, like be Muhammad Ali, be Sugar Ray, be Joe Lewis, be 
uh, Rocky Marciano, be the great white hype or the great white hope, you know. And it's like the tension was from that fight. More people saw that fight than watched this line on the moon. Really? Curious. Uh, that's because of satellites now. But that's a staggering figure when you think about that. It's more staggering when you, you think know? about why more people would watch that than watch. No, that. well, they had the access. That's that's why. The reason is they had the access, you know, from the because of satellites, which we did not have then. We had satellites, but we didn't have TV satellites then. You know, but we landed on the moon and. That was the last time I felt any kind of uh, semblance of order on this planet is <laughs> when we landed on the moon. Closest to that, <coughs> uh, it's probably uh, what's going on today in New York and what went on last Sunday in L.A. and what's going on in Bonn and Amsterdam and Japan and all around the world. This is, this, there's a total human consciousness uh, right now, this minute, folks. You know, That's the one that says, we've had enough of this nonsense. We're not, we don't want to blow ourselves up. There is a reason to live. So what if one out of every three or four is starving to death? We still want to survive. Uh, you know, we, want, we don't know where we're going, X the unknown, but we want to live. We, want to, we don't want to blow ourselves to smithereens with a bunch of dumb bullets and big ones, you know. And it's the first time I've felt that the whole world is like doing something. They're making themselves, we are making ourselves heard. The same as we felt like holding hands when we landed on the moon. It's the first time I felt that same sort of, uh, you know, uh, consciousness or whatever you call it. Right? Yeah, I feel very good about that. It makes me feel good. Well, that unity, I mean, it is imperative after all. Well, I, I excuse me, but one of the other times was when uh, in anticipation of uh, uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> I mean, that was another time when you felt, whoa, hey, everybody, uh, how you doing, you know? It was okay to say hello. Out. Well, when it came out, I should say. It was just that you felt the same kind of, well, the feeling was of anticipation because you anticipated being able to walk down the street and say, hi, we have something in common, don't we? Because we both like that. You know, it's just like, we, hi, we have something in common, don't we? We just landed on the moon. We are there, us, you know. Hi, we have something in common, don't we? What, we just put it, we just, just disarmed ourselves, you know. And you, get, and you get the feeling that, you know, a lot of us really, really want it. You know, it's not just a bunch of radicals anymore. It's just that, you know, human beings don't want to blow themselves to bits. Well, that's not true. To a large extent. Well, the planet, yeah, but, not, but I thought you meant mankind. Well, I mean, it, we, we can Don't forget the Garden of Eden. One fourth of the uh, humanity was killed uh, in the first few pages. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's pretty violent, wasn't it? That, no, I just mean Cain and Abel. Well, <laughs> the fourth of humanity. You know, Cain killed Abel. There goes one fourth of the human, if you believe the Bible. I mean, you know. The and, book well, the book. I've never read the whole book. Have you? No. Okay. Well, you don't have to. You can lie like anything. Why would I do that? Lie, well, sometimes lies are more interesting than the truth. Mm. Think of uh, the Watergate. <laughs> more humorous than the truth. If they had told the truth in the beginning, it wouldn't have been interesting at all. But the fact that they were lying made it interesting. Do we need that kind of interesting? We need that, yes. It wakes us up. Mm. <laughs> it tells us. It's the old bit, you know. Uh, uh, the truth tellers and the liars on the fork road, you know. And what's the question? You're allowed one question. Man think with forked brain. You may quote me on that. This woman said, "I mean, may I call you Nikki?" Sure. All right. May I call you? Uh, sure. May I call you New? <laughs> <laughs> okay. May I call you Eden? Speaking of the garden. Yes, of. you can. Okay. And may I call you uh, Wine? The eleventh commandment is Why not? Why not? But uh, would you? Uh, I was, well, I was going to... What? That's right. You were going to what? Pass. You were going to I was pass. going to pass. Were you really Check going to Check for the power. Okay. Um, give me some personal recollections, reminiscences, and, and fond, cherished moments about individual Beatles. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was the time in the jacuzzi in Palm Springs. Then there was the... Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Then there was Monte Carlo. No, no. Then there was uh, New York. And then there was, was Paul London. Was first that you became uh, George is the first I met. Uh, we there was sort of a deal. Uh, uh, Alan, uh, not Alan Klein. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Alan Klein. Uh, Ringo's gonna love looking at this, aren't you, pal? Hello, it's only me. I'd like to talk more about Ringo not giving autographs. <laughs> He's got the greatest. <laughs> he says things like, "I never give autographs after I've bathed." You know, he says, "I never do them on Thursday Ringo, between three and five. Huh? Yeah, I can do it for you. 
It's funny thing, you know, I, it's one of those things you just don't do. I, like, uh, I, I could have made a lot more money for the guns had I forged the signature, but uh, uh, I didn't. I asked him to sign these albums, and he did. He's been very gracious about the guns, you know. On the other hand, on the other hand, <laughs> I said, I might need some more albums. Another box of albums. He said, only 20, not 25, only 20. He goes, 20, what 20? You know. It's just that, no, he, no, it's not that, no, that it, signing five more won't hurt, that's not the point, it's just that he's got to make a deal with you, everything he does is a deal, it's like a oh. negotiation, he's a very fair negotiator, he's very, but he's very tough, Chucky. he's fair, but he's tough, yeah. you know, yeah, and I don't give a crap, you know, I just, you know, I just go, fine, you do it, I'll do it, it's, we've always, that's sort of always been an understated uh, thing, you know, well, I will if you will, you know, well, I will if you will, you know, I, mean, I've got, I, I like hanging around you, pal, you know, it's like that. The only problem with hanging around him is that people think I'm his bodyguard because I'm so big you know, and fat and he walks around and he's, you know, this little guy, hello, this is my friend. <laughs> and I go, and he pushed me aside and tried to get to him. And sometimes that's interrupted a few rather serious conversations about some heavy subject matter, man. You know. And that gets to be a pain in the ass and you get jealous of his fame sometimes. On the other hand, I wouldn't want all that fame. There's a bit of it, that it that's very attractive, you know. But he was once voted something like the seventh most famous face on the on the on the, on the nose of the earth. You know, what I mean? it was one of those. And you go, wow. Something about that's a bit frightening, though, isn't it? Well, yeah. There's nowhere to hide. He once shaved his head and shaved all his body hair, his eyebrows and his mouth and everything. Just shaved everything. And, and Monte Carlo, <clears throat> he was wearing an earring, and he smashed up a car and the uh, several, in fact, and and the police came to get him. And he's and he, I mean, he's had problems with it, like saying. Hi, I'm Ringo, you know what I mean? And they still, eventually, they know him anyway. Just, he, can't, he can't hide. There's no way you can hide if you're Ringo. John could walk around invisibly. He, I've walked down the street with him many times in the year. Uh, if you put his jacket back, put his hands in his pocket, you know, and got down, then it was John. He wanted to be John, he was John. If he wanted to be invisible, he just walked down going, Hiya, Mac. You know, <laughs> just do things, you, and you wouldn't spot him. I'm not sure now with the time that's passed whether or not the Oh. were eliminated because of the tape, but I'd really like to get some of that down. Um, well, the, as I said, Fred will give you a cassette of it. Okay. But if you want something else, sure. I just, uh, just recap, too, make sure we have on that. I'd like to just, again, because there has been a little bit of controversy. People tend to take him for granted. Well, they, 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 they take themselves for fools, then, because they, they just, uh, they don't know. I mean, I've played with them, I know. From a technical standpoint? From a technical standpoint, listen, you're asking a musician, I, I can't even play my, uh, you know, my doorbell, I, <laughs> but I but I know what I like. Now, is a uh, drummer. There are only a couple of drummers in the world I would like. You know, uh, I've, in fact, I've played with most of them. Uh, John Bonham was a great drummer. He had a, his foot was faster than my fingers. You know, I mean, you know, you could do that with one foot. And uh, but Ringo, to me, is the drummer. He's the drummer. Keith was just he had a bunch of drums. He just had targets. He closed his eyes, just hit something. You know, <laughs> it sort of sound loud. You know. <clears throat> um, Keltner is not a fine drummer because he's the undrummer. You know, he cheats, he fools you. He goes, and, you know, hits his, you know, hit the kick drum and raise his hand and do that with his left hand. And boom! And he, but Ringo is the ultimate. He's the ultimate drummer, rock and roll drummer. He's the guy. I saw him on an interview once. He looked very nervous, saying, "Well, I'm probably the best rock and roll drummer in the world." You know, but and the truth is, he is. You know, but. He looked very scared saying it because he knew that a lot of guys out there going, oh, yeah, I'm the best drummer in the world, you know. And though he, I could see him being scared about it, not scared, but not comfortable about it. You know, you think, and I wanted, to, I wanted to be right there and say, yes, you are. It's okay. You are the best rock and roll drummer in the world ever. That's it. Period. The end. Because there's one session we did in uh, uh, Crazy Little Mama. Uh, it was at my front door. And the band, it was, it was a good track, it was cooking along, I forget what take it was, but there it was, and, and it was going really good, and then all of a sudden it started to fall apart, and just at that moment, he just come busting through like he was busting through a door, he's like, brought it right back, you know, that's drumming. Because he was listening to the singer, he was listening to the piano player, he was listening to the, the record, he was listening to all the records that had ever been made in history before, and he just jumped in and went, okay, and that's, I mean, that's about as good as it gets. Most assholes sit there and, hi, I'm a drummer. You know, but uh, no, he, 
And I don't care which hand he plays with either. He just hits them. You know, he just hits these dead animal skins on pieces of wood going. All right. Hello. Oh, must be for me. Hello? No, I'm not taking any calls now. Thank you. So, you know, but he's, he's the best one. All right. Now, Paul. Granted, uh, uh, Gene Cooper was not bad either. <laughs> but he couldn't do what Ringo could do. I don't know if Ringo could do what he does either. Hal Blaine's just a great professional drummer. I mean, he's a great professional drummer. You never put down studio cats. They're always, they're your friends. It's like, it's like actors always defending stuntmen. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely. It's like Earl Palmer. There are guys like that who are just incredible. Yeah, that's right, they are the backbone, but it's, it's more important that the, the, the backbone doesn't say it enough. I mean, if you say the spinal column, that means a little more. The, you know, the third vertebrae is when you go crip, you know? <laughs> so. Well, that's right. But there, I know there are any number of uh, people from the Arbors, from Laura Bannon. There's also some people like Kathleen. They all have to be... Well, let me give them some. Musicians. <laughs> well, you know how to... You have to defend them. Come on. Yeah. I'll always defend them. I'll always defend anybody with talent. Um, Talent's the bottom line. However... Why is he getting that black? Why well, is he because he deserves it. Okay, why... And he knows it, too. All right, so why? Well, simply because, uh, as an example, on uh, 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 Ringo's last album, he wrote a song that sounded like Hand Me Down Laundry. You know, it was like, uh, dig the lyric. This is the most successful songwriter on the planet. Hope you're listening, Paul. The most successful songwriter on the planet. And he writes words, let's say, come on, baby, give it all you got. Give in to the power of the plot. No, that's wrong. Okay? Did it work in context of That's people sense it. I think he sensed it as well. I think he's grown up and matured enough to say, well, you know, maybe they're right. And I think he's now trying to get down and write some more, you know, stuff. Because you know? he's one of the greatest rock and roll singers of all time. And he says it in a tremendous sense of melody, and he plays great bass, and he's, you know, he's all around, you know, you're utility infielder for rock and roll. If you're in the all-star team, you know. And he is the most successful songwriter in history. Right. You can't, you never take that away from him. He's done more than anybody else. I mean, Mulligan Tie, and I mean, just, just, I mean, you <laughs> drop any name, any song, turn on the radio, and you'll hear a Paul McCartney tune, right? But on the other hand, you don't do that to your friend, I don't think. You just don't give him your throwaways. Was you could have written a better song for Ringo, is what I'm saying. I understand. Was John an important discipline for Paul, in terms of the quality of the song? I didn't know them as a group. I didn't know, see, that was their relationship. I had a relationship with John. It was, uh, we were roommates a couple of times, you know, for short times. Uh, month and a half in uh, New York and a month and so on out here and a bit in Las Vegas and a little bit in Palm Springs, you know, and a bit in London, you know. But uh, uh, Ringo and I are friends. It's funny, I always thought I would be closer to John, but in, and over the years, Ringo and I have ended up being pals. I don't know why, but we just have ended up being that, you know. And, okay. But John and I seem to have had more in common in another way, because uh, I guess because it's writing or uh, singing or something like that, you know. Let me, let me get your impression about something to take me out for a moment. Um, I interviewed John a couple of times, and what struck me, apart from the obvious talent and the, the intelligence and the wit, it re really blew me away. Just like me, isn't he? There are some same bathrobe. <laughs> it was not the same bathrobe. Uh, I gave him my Schmilson bathrobe. Did he, you? Yeah, and he gave me his, uh, I am the walrus jacket, Ooh. which I gave to my sister. <laughs> if you get the Brian Wilson back as long, we don't need to know. Um, <laughs> yeah. this, would, this would probably go for an auction for $5. And Who knows? Maybe not. <laughs> maybe nothing. Maybe $4. I was blown away by a certain enthusiasm. Oh. You would surprise me. You yeah, zest easy. for life. Well, all right. <laughs> Here's a man who's been interviewed possibly more than any other five people in the history of the world. Yeah. Always gave respect to the person he was talking to. Yeah. Took those questions seriously. Tried to find a fresh approach, and never seemed to lose his enthusiasm for anything. Tell me from your perspective about that. Was that an What'd accurate you say? observation? What'd you say? That is inaccurate. Good <laughs> move. Well, it was zest for living. I mean, he he really did want to answer questions, just like I really want to answer questions. You know, you got me. You know, it's like that. And you say, okay, you ask the question. Here's the answer. And, you, and when you, especially if you've answered it 5,000 times, it's, it, the challenge is to, how can I say it again? What does it take to let, make you hear it? And if you haven't read the other article, maybe you'll read this article, you'll see this tape or something, you know. 
and I, and I and I love him for that. He was always, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talked directly to people and he listened to them, and he could listen real good. I mean, he was fast, fast listener. We're talking about John Lennon. You don't know him. You're too young. No, because he's <laughs> dead. Well, that's true, but that doesn't mean that you're not too young to know him. Right? No, I don't know what I said. What did I say? Do you listen to his music, Bob? What? Do you listen to his music? Do I? Do you? No. You don't? Well, this is some Beatle albums, and uh, I think well, you spotted John several times. See, that's John, you know, because he's the he's the he's the guy with the funny voice. Remember Jim? No. The last time Bo saw John was uh, Sean. Well, it was just at the let's see. John. Bo was, well, Sean was his son. Is his son? Who one is Sean? Sean is one of his sons. Or the, well, I say his because he was married twice, just like me. But he. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was. We brought Bo over to see Sean in his, at the Dakota in '76. Uh, uh, How old is Sean? He was, was older than Bo. Mm. So when we had Bo, we brought him over there. And uh, you know, John was just you know in New York. We were just si sipping tea and you know, being real straight, and I was drinking brandy. And you know, after a while, he, st he he was so fast he used to spot. Like I would go. You could tell by the look in my ear. You know, that there's, there, uh oh, that's one step over the line. That's the end, you know, like that instant, you know. So, well, probably time to wrap it up now, you know, <coughs> like that. <laughs> but no, but his interviews, I've, I, didn't, I haven't really read many of his interviews, and we've only, we only did one or two interviews uh, together, you know, and uh, in the studio or someplace. And, and uh, but no, he's an amazing, he listens to the interviewer, interviewee, or interviewer, yeah. And uh, as I try, I've tried to do with you, and uh, I, uh, so you've asked some complicated questions. Are yes, what me? is it? Hey, Are Ollie. What? What? Remember the old adage? What old adage? You can lead a... They were covered. Whose sure. microphone is this? That's Fred's. No, it's yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you hear, this, hear a very high-pitched... Uh, there is one going on yeah. Oh, is that what that is? Oh. Something I can't walk into because the frequency of the, the light stuff kills yeah. me. Yeah, the dimmers do that. Is that what they are? Rheostats, yeah. Oh, can't deal with it. Well, I it's the brakes. <laughs> okay, here we go. What is it? You're still talking Eight about Eight minutes left, Joan. All right, we're talking about Paul, and, and you're talking about his songwriting and so forth. Sorry, Cordy. I'll have Ringo yell at you. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm not afraid of him. See, you should have that on the uh, Go ahead, say it again. I'm not afraid of him. No, he's not afraid of anybody, except me. Roar! I'm not afraid of you either. Well, then leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, try to scare me. Okay. He's got your number. I can't scare you. You can scare me, but you frighten me sometimes. Scare yeah, what? Roar! Jeez, that actually did scare me a little bit. Okay. Let's, let, let's finish our interview, okay? Because we're running out of tea. Okay? Ooh. All right. Tell me more about John, on a personal level. Uh, Why was he wonderful? Why was Because he was one of a kind. I mean, there was just no one like him. Uh, he had a sense of show business, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and he was just one of those guys. He just uh, he could, he could play his part, and he knew what it was, and he wasn't afraid. He was like him, you know, uh, just uh, no fear. They, uh, there's another part that was, you know, <laughs> So they like me. Doesn't anybody think I'm all right? You know, Mama, where are you? You know, it's all that stuff. But, but on the other side, but he was tough as nails. He just uh, fearless and just said what he felt. You know? And that's something that he was always ahead. He was always a couple of steps ahead of you, no matter what you did. He was always he just beat you to the punch line. You know, and it's like that. Uh, with reference to all the other people we talked about, you're, they're all great. And this is on a very uh, personal level. I'm just saying they bore me or they don't bore me. But on the other hand, how do you, you can't, anybody who sits down, puts a word on a piece of paper, and then lets the buzzes and hisses come out of their throat and uh, does something and goes to a studio and tries to get a contract and works their ass off and goes and makes a record, good or bad, in my estimation, doesn't matter. The, the point is to do it. Uh, is the good thing. And they, and they, they have, all the people we talked about, even though I'm joking about you know, well, they bored me, and I don't like that, and I don't like all the dead people, and all that. But uh, uh, the fact is that they did, they did it, and that's the big one.
to tire her. And a lot of other people liked it more than they liked me. So where's that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of closet fans, too. Oh, yeah, but they're the, the weaklings. You know, you realize I'm not going to leave here until you sing without you for me. Without you? For me? <laughs> for me. Um, you did an album. Yeah, I didn't. See, that's, I hate that one, too. Boring song. You know, you shouldn't say, I guess that's just the way the story goes. You say, I know. This is the way the story goes. You know, you should say something like that, but you should. become a nightclub singer. You don't need a nightclub singer. What did you, no, I misunderstood you. Uh, what I'm saying is, um, um, the song without you, uh, that makes you a nightclub singer. Okay? And uh, that's why I, I didn't write it, so it's like, you know, uh, <clears throat> therefore I did not write the words. I guess that's just the way this, that's a closet singer, or writer. You don't say, I guess, if you can help it. I wrote a song called How to Write a Song. You should hear it sometime, and it'll, you know. <laughs> I don't know the song. Well, that's all right. But it tells you how to write songs. I mean, as far as I can, uh, you know, don't use the word.